so uh, we talk about GANs, then we started to talk about like Boseman machine, and then uh, let, let's continue to talk about Boseman machine, then we'll move on to like um, <coughs> autoencoder. So, um, actually, by the way, like I guess I, I forgot to mention like. Uh, why Boseman machine we, we put it in this session because apparently Boseman machine is also a generative model so for example uh, if I have this these are the hidden hidden layers and this is a uh, the whatever the visible layer so after like we have trained the model and we put in something in the hidden layers here then we were able to generate different kind of like every time we can just simulate this model then if each time we generate different samples right so therefore it's also a generative model here <coughs> and we talk about like okay original Boseman machine is in kind of intractable so therefore like that's the so-called restricted Boseman machine is just a, a simplified version that <coughs> we have the a bipartite graph instead and the hidden hidden units on one side and the visible units on the other side and basically hidden units cannot interconnect to each other and so so as for the visible units and um, and with that well, we can derive the conditional probabilities that uh, we kind of mentioned that so uh, so eventually we have the conditional probabilities uh, of let's say uh, for the <coughs> Given the visible layers, so this is supposed to be a bold X here. So, uh, and the condition probability of particular hidden unit uh, will be given by this sigmoid function. And uh, so, in terms of data generation, it will be basically using Gibbs sampling. So, we'll sample. If we go go back to the image here. Uh, basically, we fix, for example, like with some uh, visible units here that's fixed. Uh, and let's say at the beginning, maybe this is like a classification problem, as, as we uh, kind of like mentioned last time. So, this is an uh, input features, and then we're kind of like uh, splitting out the class, classes here. So, at the beginning, we may just say like, have this visible units as the input here, so input features, and then we just randomize this guy here for this one, and then using Gibbs sampling, we can sample for each of this H here, the hidden units here, and after we sample this H, we can go back to sample each of this guy here. Maybe this hidden uh, input layer is fixed, then we only sample this guy and this guy, and then the in the next situation, we will we sample for this H, and then we go back and forth until this these two nodes is kind of converge, then um, this will be uh, our output basically. And uh, <coughs> and in terms of training, uh, we need to know the marginal probability because like, this is basically the cause is like uh, uh, some, something like this is long as the evidence actually in statistics, given your um, how your model fits with your data basically. So if your model P here apparently is parametrized by your W, C, and B, and so on, how good is this model fitting to your data? So if my data here is like X here, my PX, I hope that to be big, right? So I hope that this P is to be large. So uh, therefore, like, uh, in training this model, basically, I just plug in a uh, training data for this X, and then I will try to maximize this PX here. And then therefore we need to find the marginal probability that I guess we ran for last time, the marginal probability will be just equal to this exponential sort plus function plus this uh, CTX here, C transfer X here. And also like we uh, often like call this guy <coughs> the free energy, just use F to represent that. Uh, so or minus free energy. So the higher the energy, uh, the probability is smaller. So lower the energy, the probability is higher. And um, so actually, I, I was confused a little bit myself, like because I actually there's a typo here uh, yeah, last time. So and uh, but it it uh, I I uh, yeah. But basically, up everything afterwards correct. 
So as I mentioned, like we want to maximize this probability, right? Or like if x t is at the, at the training data, let's say x one up to x capital T at the training data. So maximizing p x t is the same as maximizing log p x t. It's not exactly the same because we we sum together, but we are actually trying to maximize this uh, power to power ratio or something like that. So uh, log x one p x two and so on. So if we take a log, it become a sum. So therefore, like uh, is just a uh, log minus b. Uh, and of course, I for machine learning convention, we always like to minimize instead of maximize. So we we just like put a minus sign. So to minimize this loss here, and then I uh, because p x is equal to uh, exponential minus f x over the uh, normalization factor z here. So therefore, like this minus log px become this one here and then if you continue to expand that you or oh, actually we don't uh yeah take the part uh, okay yeah if we take just the partial derivative just of this term or just basically basically just this term with, with respect to the parameter theta here so then we have this partial f x t theta and then we have another term here uh, so anyway, like it's one log c here. So c uh, but c is the normalization factor, right? So c is actually equal to exponential minus f uh, x uh, sum over all x. So if we take uh, partial derivative of log c here, so the, uh, with respect to uh, theta here, so then I have like one over z, right? And then like uh, take partial z, partial theta, and partial z, partial theta is just exponential minus f. This is therefore equal to this one is equal to uh, exponential minus f uh, x uh, partial f partial theta, something like that. Then, of course, if you look at this guy here, um. Oh, I have the summation here. I need to make sure I have the sum. I have a summation here, sum over all x here. So, and uh, if I look at this guy here, or like my c can come get inside. Therefore, I have this one here. This one is actually just the probability, right? This one is actually just equal to uh, p x here. So, therefore, it's really what we have is really just an expectation of this term here. So, as you mentioned last time, this is something like a positive or negative phase. So the positive phase is that like you look at the training data. You want to maximize uh, f x for for that data for x t. You want to ma maximize that uh, for for uh, f x t, and then at the same time, like uh, for all the other possible data, if you pull out from the statistics of your uh, samples there for the current distribution, uh, for the rest, the f x uh, the partial derivative of f with respect to theta should be small, um, and uh, and as we mentioned last time, like this really is a sum or like integral over all x, y. Right? So therefore, it's difficult to compute. But this guy is an expectation, right? We can use Monte Carlo to approximate that. Basically, it's, it's, it's that like we can just sample a couple x. Uh, be uh, that is according to the current distribution and then we will take the average of those uh, um, as an uh, estimate of this expectation that's typical what Monte Carlo will do and in a re even more extreme case we'll simply sample one data point here we don't care we just sample one data point and use that as representation therefore last time we said we have this CTK algorithm it's like how we sample this one point here one x here what we're going to do is I just we have this original x here training data here then we can sample the edge and then from the edge we can sample x again then we can repeat this sample like several times and this is known as this contrastive uh, divergence k algorithm and uh, in practice like, most people just use cd1 so that is just you do it one time like sample one time for edge then sample one time for x and take this one as x tutor basically um, that's basically kind of where we ended last time. So, how much do I use for this review? Oh, okay, ten minutes, not bad. 
<coughs> so then uh then the parameter update so therefore like we is remember in the previous slides this is expectation right now it's we paste it back it used to be like expectation of like parcel f x parcel theta now we replace it by like just replaced by this just x one time in x tutor um and we know that fx is actually this one here we got it earlier then if we take the uh, and remember what are the parameters the model parameters really are this c w and b right so we want to take partial derivative with this c w and b here <coughs> and what we get is like you can very easy to verify uh that that's what we get so therefore like the actual update for c for example would be just um so here, of course, I am counting to pass partial derivative of each of the elements. So therefore, if you think of like really partial f, partial c is equal to just minus x y, and for example, this is partial f, partial b is really equal to um, let's say minus sigma uh, w x plus b something like that, <coughs> and this one will be. Uh, um, the ij element so this is actually is a column vector and uh, I, I the ij element is equal to uh, I mean the ij element of parcel f parcel w the ij element is equal to this guy right is equal to this one and therefore this one is actually this is a column vector multiplied by this whole vector will get this way so therefore we have sigmoid wx uh, xt plus b uh, multiplied by this xt transpose stuff like that <coughs> and um, this was the cdk algorithm and and um, there's a modification kind of enhancement of the cdk algorithm known as this persistent cd uh, because i rem remember that this x tutor after all why we want to do this sampling is that we just want to get an uh, approximation uh, of of expectation parcel f parcel theta something like that and and the, and the better approximate um and our x tutor is in this case of course is if for cd1 or cdk which is example one time and each time i use the the uh, the training data so uh and uh, because i uh you only sample one time so it, it's not converging yet so a better approach could be like this. Uh, you will just use the previous intervention x tutor. So you are keeping the previous x tutor and continue to iterate. So you should have better convergence property. So this x tutor should be a better approximation of the actual of an actual sample. So and um, this this um, uh, kind of uh, modification is known as uh, the persistent uh, persistency the algorithm. Um, or you can think of this as actually similar to a CDK with a large K, but uh, the capacity will be lower right? because each time it's just one the CD one, but uh, you you actually um, uh, yeah actually you you have it looks like you you have this X tutor more like a CDK CDK with a large K. So and uh, one more thing is like. Um, you see, like for all the models we mentioned up to now, for the Boltzmann and the restricted Boltzmann machine, we are considering binary variables. So it's a kind of restrictive, and it's possible to extend that to continuous variables. So to make it continuous variables, we can add an additional uh, element for our energy function. So of course, we just look at here. <coughs> You can make it continuous anyway. You just assume, okay, I, I, I don't just take this COM1, but I, I just take care of continuous variables. Um, but I probably, like, probably it would be better, like, besides doing that, also add this uh, terms here. Because if I add these terms here, the distribution for X really become a Gaussian distribution. It, it kind of make more sense. And, and then, um, and also this function will have an effect of regularization that it, it will be because you want the energy to be small right? so this is like kind of reducing the size of x here so um 
and, and then like with that adjustment, then uh, then basically okay, I I don't have more slides here, but uh, you will need to kind of redivide like everything at the beginning, so uh, your kind of like your um your F and so on, like your your free energy uh, expression of course will be a little bit different like for this guy, and then like but. Be beyond that, like you still doing same thing, like trying to train the model is like you compute the marginal probability, and the marginal oh, okay, I should say the marginal probability will be kind of like still like this form here, but I I will have this free energy is kind of different, and I have this px here again. I try to maximize this probability or like I try to minimize this uh minus log p probability uh minus log p here as the loss function, um. And uh, and then like you can still use a uh, steeper descent or like any other optimizer to try to train the model to find W C and B and so on. <coughs> for in practice, like for this kind of like Gaussian, because you see like X now is Gaussian, so therefore like it's also known as like, Gaussian Bolognio like RPM. Um, uh. Typically, we will have the input here, like to normalize and zoom mean. So just at the p processing, uh, so because I, uh, yeah, you you have Gaussian here. We we essentially have a variance is like. This is actually a Gaussian distribution with variance is equal to one, right? Because, uh, if you know a Gaussian distribution, it it has uh, a cross term like, uh, x transpose sigma x, uh, actually like this. And this is basically the variance here, a uh, covariance matrix here. So when we, uh, we don't put anything here, just intuitively mean that like it's a, a univariance actually. So um, so therefore like it, it, this model, but by how you construct that, this only able capable to model like a uh, univariance uh, data. So you better make it like univariance and uh, yeah, and. Uh, and b because it's a more complex model, like um, typically we also need to reduce the learning rate uh, for better stability. Um, oh uh, yes, and uh, okay, I guess I, I I go pretty fast. I maybe I can slow down a little bit. So one reason that we like to talk about RBM is uh, historically it's very important, like. Um, this is uh, used to train this kind of uh, deep belief network. This is th the first like successful model like uh, for deep learning, like back in like, around two thousand six or two thousand seven. So, <coughs> it's DBN itself is is also a generative model. It it has a pretty uh, interesting structure here. Uh, the first two layers is like a uh, Richard Boltzmann machine. So in the sense that like, this. This uh connection here is, is really like uh undirected connection. So if you know like this graphical model here, so the um this this graph when you have undirected graph uh for to say a model is just saying that for example if I have undirected graph like 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 this, this is x one, x two, x three here. So this undirected graph just saying that like the Joint probability of this model will be something like p x one x two, p x two x three, and it didn't specify the causality here. Kind of causality, not exactly causality, but um the belief lateral is like this part here, uh, long as belief belief lateral. Uh, uh, in this case, I yeah, let's call this belief lateral first. So for the belief network, like typically uh, you have the arrow, something like that, for example, x1, x2, and x3 here. So the joint probability will be modeled like um, I have px1, and then px2 will be a, uh, this conditional probability is, is uh, given. So uh, x2 is directly kind of like um, um, kind of, uh, uh, related to x1. And given x one, I actually it's not relating to x. Oh, sorry, x three here. So and also I have like x uh three given x one. I say, so th this is like a direct direct graph model. So it's a combination of undirected uh graph and direct graph model for the DBM. Um, 
and DBM, yeah. And uh, I'm also like for the direct graph model here, the conditional probability more precisely will be um, kind of a model by this like sigmoid function. So it's like a sigmoid. Uh, it's like similar to what we have earlier. Basically, it's, it's essentially the probability is just a think of like you have the hidden unit layer here, go for a linear layer, so we'll multiply by W, right? And uh, weight the sum by the current input here, like whether it's like, uh, it's, uh, let's see, yeah, here, we have current input here. And, and with that, we will just go for an activation function like using sigmoid. So that, that uh, for this particular form of this, um, uh, belief lab, uh, basin network, uh, like we'll call it like sigmoid belief network, and uh, and as you can see, like this DBN is a combination of these two, and it's not actually fit forward networks. Uh, be careful, like even for this part, like it looks like like uh, fit forward, but be careful, it's not really a fit forward network. So it just specifies the conditional probability. So given the probability here, uh. You, you need some kind of sampling. It's not like saying that, okay, uh, the this one here will be just equal to uh, this H2 multiplied by this one, right? This is not the output here. It's not a fit forward lateral. You, you don't directly get the output as like multiplied by this guy. It just specifies the probability for you. And then like, uh, according to a typical, you use sampling to decide what was the actual value for this guy. Maybe you want it to, yeah, yeah, you can sample with it. And of course, like this layer in particular, the restricted Boson machine is no way to be a uh, fit for networks. So it's it's actually it's interesting. It's a more complicated model, like a decade more than a decade ago than what we have now. Uh, this is like uh, what people did like in two thousand six, um, or two thousand six. This is like some history of DBN. I think uh, it's quite interesting. Like it's from like uh, Hinton's. Like, I don't know why I. I need to change that. Hinton's uh, course, Sarah's course. He mentioned that like uh, he was playing with I say more belief network. So that's this this one without this thing here, just this one here. And he wanted to find an uh, efficient way to change this more belief networks. Then he he he's kind of like toy with like different idea, but it didn't went well. So he moved back on to some other works. Like he he was working on like RBM and then like. Um, he go, went back to that and eventually invented like the CDK algorithm to train RBM. Then he found that uh, CDK is very efficient, very effective. Then it's kind of tempting to see like, if he can use this for a similar belief network, right? So, and then it turns out it worked great. And then like, he thought that, okay, he solved uh, training for this uh, similar belief network. But it turns out the student, his student at that time, like uh, UIT, I think he's uh, teaching in Oxford or like uh, UCL, I forgot. Um, he, uh, he's, his very smart student just point, pointed to him that like, no, no, you are not kind of training the uh, same belief lateral. Actually, you're training a different model, a model that like you actually have RBM here. So it's like, they, therefore they introduced a new name for this lateral, they call it deep belief lateral. And, uh, and it turns out this is like the first successful use uh, of deep learning, like in modern era, um, to solve some actual problems. So I will show you, like, you know, they still have the demo, like after like over a decade, like online. So uh, you can see like they they are using that to uh, have like a uh, character uh, kind of digital recognition and doing quite well. Uh, actually, very well, actually, even in today's standard. Um, uh, and and just a remark, I like, do not confuse with like deep Boltzmann machines. There's so many different names there. So uh, uh, so for deep Boltzmann machines, each of the layers are RBM. But here, like I have like first layer, first two layers, are RBM, and then for the other layers are actually a similar uh, similar belief lat. So um, and uh, let's see, I want to. Take a look at my nose. Yeah. <coughs> so okay, 
how, how they are going to train that, that, that there will be two steps. First is that they will do a P-training. So P-training is say, um, they will treat uh, every two layers as RBM. So think of like, uh, actually they need to start from bottom because uh, that's what where they have the data, right? Let's say I have the data X here. I want to maximize the probability uh, for, of the model for PX, right? So I have the data here. Then I will treat these two layers as RBM. Then uh, I will basically like train the lateral model such that will maximize this X here, right? So then in the meantime, I basically got these hidden units, like probably uh, hidden units, right? So I will have samples of these hidden, hidden units now. So once I got samples for these hidden units, then I will treat, treat these two layers as uh, RBM again. Then I will ignore this layer and I ignore the rest of the layers. Then I will repeat the steps, right? Then I will train these two layers so that to maximize uh, what I got earlier the probability for what I got earlier. So for, for whatever I got sample for this pH1 here, I want to maximize the probability for this uh, RBM model for these two middle layers here. Then afterward, I will get other samples, another set of samples of H2 right here. So I will repeat that and do the same thing. So then uh, during this process, I basically will have like trained weight for each of these layers here, for uh, basically WBMC for each of the layers here. Uh, this is the p-training step. So once you have the p-training step, let's see. <coughs> then then we will do a fine tuning. So a fine tuning will be like uh, <coughs> we'll do a. Let's see what what should we do. We we we'll first do a bottom up step first. So once we train that we have this W, right? Uh, w, let's say we have this W B M C, but let's focus on the W here. So we have the W and, <coughs> and basically the W will define like if I have the uh, hidden unit here. So, oh, by the way, because this is a sigmoid belief network. So remember that like we have the model is something like that. We have the W, of course we have the B here also, but uh, you have the W here, and given the H, we will know the probability of this one here. I, actually, I should look at this line here. So if we are given the W and B here, and given the H here, we will get like probability of this guy here. <coughs> so with the W and H, actually, we, we, we have the given hidden units here. We know, um, let's say if we fix here, we'll have probability. Oh, oh, actually, I shouldn't fix here. Let's say if I fix here, I will... I can sample some of this H1 here. I can sample some of this X here, right? Uh, but, <coughs> um, but also I can flip it to the other way one. So <coughs> I have W. If I have W, uh, given this, I can sample this guy. Now I will define something called R as the transfer of W. And actually given this R and given X here, I can sample H here. So for the fine tuning, what we are going to do is say, uh, given X here, given this training samples here, now I, I'm going to use the current R to just sample some H, H1 and H2. So now I will have sample like for here, the guys, this guy, this guy, and this guy now. Now, after I have sample for this guy here, now I can do, uh, consider this as a RBM models, then I will just say, uh, train this RBM, uh, just uh, not train this time, I'm going to, uh, just run this RBM model several times. So afterward, I will have some sample here. Then after that, I will just use W again. Like, remember, like R, given R, I can sample upward. Given W, I'm going to sample downward. Um, and uh, I will... Uh, uh, wait a sec. <coughs> oh, actually, it's, uh, yes. Given the sample here, what I'm going to do is say after I do this going upward to get sample from this guy and then kind of like simulate this RBM for several times, then I have update sample for this guy now. Now I have sample for this guy and sample for this guy. I'll use this to fine tune my W because I given this I can actually sample downward. Sample downward like how was how should I basically will be how should I adjust this W so that like I will have a large pair of this and this way. So okay. 
after this is done like we can just do the reverse do the reverse will be basically uh, uh, we can do top down now uh, uh, previously we are, we are just fix out going upward and then find some samples here and fine tune W now this time I will start from here I will sample like downward so I will fix W sample downward to get this one now I, I use this and this to fine tune the transfer or that, that, that basically the R so <coughs> this is a summary of I just mentioned here and this is don't get long as the uh, up down algorithm or like this contrastive like wick slip algorithm uh, for fine tuning of RBM and uh, using this refinement and fine tuning then you, you can train the RBM uh, sorry train the DBN and uh, this is an actual <coughs> example of application I mentioned earlier so we can uh, we have um, an image here like uh, just a MNIST data uh, just a digit then like uh, we ha can have like 500 units of hidden units here so this is basic factorized right so this is a yes. uh, similar belief network here <coughs> um, so you given that you can sample like uh, going downward you can sample with, with W and again I go going upward you can sample with R that's basically W transpose and then I here uh, assuming that everything is trained of course after everything is trained then uh, given an image you can sample upward like with R right? so then afterward like you just say like, do RBM here like several times like then like for this part here you give the label without the label output basically and uh, what they get at that time is like error rate about 1% it's actually uh, pretty good uh, and uh, let's see if I, I can find the uh, <coughs> I think I opened that somewhere uh, yeah this one here so <laughs> as I said after like 14 13 years they still have this demo online it's pretty cool and uh, the digital you see is pretty kind of like not really that easy to recognize so um we can one that I think is like when you want that like, you see like it's kind of um so you know that like this model itself is like a uh, not a fit forward model as I said it's, this is like a uh, dynamic dynamical model so therefore like you see this <coughs> um, this label like actually move around also so what we can do is say like, uh, let's see if I increase this I guess hopefully you we'll said so one one thing we can do is say like, you you can just um <coughs> so maybe I can try another one again so it will move around but you can sample at a period of time right? for example like you like like the model one for a period of time and see like how long does it stay like in each of these uh, labels say if it stay most of the time here then I would say like this is like belong to this label so and do you guys have any questions I, I guess like, that's that's what I uh, everything I like to talk about for uh, RBM and Boseman machine um, so <coughs> So, uh, if no questions, then uh, <coughs> we'll move on to another different potential generative model, autoencoder. So, um, autoencoder um, by default is not a generative model, but uh, we, we, as you see later on, I, I, we can uh, eventually we'll talk about a variational autoencoder it is uh, actually also a generative model so uh, but think of like what's the uh, the motivation at the beginning why we are people interested in autoencoder so um, <coughs> the original motivation I think is a uh, for dimension reduction I, I guess I maybe I should start with a model first so of course I uh, um, what I want to say like uh, here like I, I maybe I should skip these slides here for dimension reduction there's um, the classic approach is of course PCA and uh, and, uh, and PCA is uh, is actually um, optimized optimum if you are considering linear model I, I will uh, specify more clearly what I mean here but I, I think I will skip the PCA I guess uh, you, you guys know what is PCA 
so um, so uh, and uh, you, you can show the PC is optimum actually um, um, what, what PC does of course um, okay maybe I, I shouldn't just skip like that maybe just uh, what P PC maybe I just um, give you a kind of quick reminder like maybe uh, uh, so uh, like this one what you you have data sample in some high dimensional space like let's say this is just two dimensional of course what PC try to capture is they try to find uh, the so called principal components so here like this this is uh, the principal components and the spread of these principal components are basically the eigenvalues so and also that these principal components is actually the eigenvectors and uh, and how big of the eigenvalues is actually the spread and, and uh, okay I, I already talked about eigenvalue of eigenvector but uh, I should specify eigenvalue of eigenvector of what uh, it's the eigenvalue of uh, an eigenvector of the covariance matrix of this data point so let's say if I have this data point here and let's say if I'm going to um, uh, generate empirical uh, covariance matrix let's say I have x data point like x1, x2 I have let's say <coughs> k data point here up to xk and let's say this is n dimension right so then I have like a n by k matrix here and then I, I, I can say uh, compute the covariance of x uh, xi and xj uh, this correla correlation. Oh, here I am assuming still mean just to make things simple. So this co can be approximated as like um, okay. This this actually is a uh, bills of rotation is pretty bad. Let let me see if I can do a little bit better. <coughs> um, I have like x one, x two, and so on up to x k like k vectors here. This is h of n here. And then, like, I have the covariance matrix uh, for i j element c i j. So, where i is like from one to n, and j is also from one to n. Note that it's a like one to n, it's not one to k. So I have k vectors here. I'm looking into like, for example, this h of vector maybe like hundred dimensions. I want to see like, for example, the f uh, third, uh, third coefficient. Uh, how the first coefficient are correlated with the second coefficient, let's say, then that would be like C2 phi, something like that. And then the C2 phi will be what? C2 phi will be uh, expectation of like x, uh, x2, x3. So know that like the index are different. This is I'm saying like this I have vectors, this is okay, let's say the x2 coefficient, x3 coefficient. And, uh, and if you, you, you write it out, C is actually can be approximated as just uh, if I call this whole matrix a big X here it will be just a big X uh, let's see this uh, this is N uh, I should have uh, K uh, sorry transpose X something like that so I, I can approximate this coherence matrix and then like if I if when I approximate this coherence matrix and then I and I try to diagonalize that those eigenvectors will be these eigenvectors and then like if I just uh, consider the highest uh, eigenvectors of the high eigenvalue so then I can just project my sample only to these dimensions here so and then I can do dimension reduction um, so <coughs> So okay, I, I guess I, I should just really skip this. This is not the core part I like to talk about. But my point is say like, for dimension reduction, you can consider it's just like some operation. Like I have x here. This is a, a vector, maybe like a hundred or or like a ten ten thousand dimensions, and h x will map to like much lower dimension, maybe just hundred dimension, let's say, and uh, <coughs> and one can show that like for PCA, uh. Uh, as long as your recover your reconstruction, let's say if I have this H operation, it can be nonlinear. It doesn't matter whether it's linear or not. But as long as your reconstruction step is linear, so saying that like if I have this 
uh, compares it to something like uh, cos C, it's like from 10,000, 100,000 dimension to 10, uh, 100 dimension. And now from Z, I'm going back to, let's say, X hat, like a Posmer X hat. So if my reconstruction here is, is linear, so something like X hat is equal to some Z, uh, sorry, uh, is equal to this W multiplied Z. So of course, in this case, this W should be sort of dimension like uh, 10,000 by 100, something like that, right? So as long as your reconstruction step here is linear, then actually PC is, is optimum. So this operation here will be simply PC. But uh, but if so uh, so like like this here. So let's say if I have let's say consider if I build a network. So this step here, I have X coming in. I have some some complicated network op operation and have a compression here. And this here, if I do a reconstruction re using just a linear layer, then this one will be PC. But of course, like this reconstruction step doesn't need, need to be uh, linear as well. So if I make it also non linear, then it doesn't have to, to be PC, right? For example, like this one here, this one can be a lateral going down into like smaller and smaller dimension. This can be a lateral going up, increase the dimension, and you eventually have this output here. <coughs> And what was fun about this is like, okay, this this is the autoencoder structure typically. What's fun about that is like, I can. It's kind of like self learning, right? It's a supervised training, right? supervised learning, and also like self learning, because I can pack in whatever data I have, right? The data I have, I pack in both in uh, at the input side and the output side. What I'm trying to train the model is that I'm hoping to train the model such that for this model here, uh, my my output will be identical in to, as input. So if that is true, then what does that mean? That means that like this part here actually kind of compress all the information of the original input, right? If it doesn't, because this is the bottleneck, right? If it doesn't act actually extract this original information, it won't be able to recover back to the original input, right? So, and th therefore like, uh, this is actually, kind of like old idea back to the 80s but it's considered very hard to do like until like uh 20 okay, that's actually the time that like, also did by Hinton and like, he, he even have a science paper for that uh basically he used the RBM again like that's why why we like to also uh, discuss RBM before that so how he did that like how Hinton trained this model at that time is like they have this letter here then again, they, they use layer by layer pre-training. So they treat each of these, every two layers as RBM. And then like, they pre-train that. After you pre-train that, you have the weights there. Then you can do a, uh, just use a, <coughs> a regular training. Uh, but honestly, of course now, like at, this is the time before people even realize like weight initialization is important and so on. So therefore like, um, um, don't have all these other tricks like like uh, like uh, <coughs> drop out or, or whatever. So <coughs> therefore, like um, um, actually nowadays, like people don't don't actually train it this way. They don't need to use layer by layer RBM. They can just train it like 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 uh, what we see like for uh, regular feed forward uh, neural network, just using bad pop and then like. Have have other trick uh, like uh, batch normalization, weight individual individualization, and so on to train the weights. Um, and uh, but the result at that time is very good. Like I, and uh, this is the original data. Like for some phases, and then they use this deep autoencoder reconstruction. You see, compared to PCA, is much better basically. Uh, uh, so and, and uh, of course you can also use this to visualize uh, data. It's like similar uh, because of Tisley basically you can uh, this uh, basically you you down sample the data uh, with this code there in the middle and just look at the first two assets uh, first two components and you can draw different data here so this is a like, document data uh, you can see like this group pretty well like for different document data and they also test on a like, image retrieval just doing the same thing so you have that you use like pca not pca sorry like you use like 
autoencoder and use the middle layer as your feature. So and then uh, you compare the Euclidean distance of the features or like inner border of the features to decide like whether one image is close to another image and then you can uh, use that for image retrieval. So oh by the way like uh, any questions I don't know I, I, I think I'm speaking really fast. Um, so I guess still pretty quiet. So um and uh, for autoencoder uh, uh, at that time I besides using this LBM to train, uh, actually the other group like by Banjo, they also have an alternative training idea. Uh, it's it's uh, simpler to to understand or like simpler to use. Um, I I think for most practical purposes because I uh, LBM is seems like more uh what should I say like uh uh kind of um not typical like a uh, kind of non canonical like stuff to work with nowadays. I guess like at least like, it doesn't look like uh PyTorch have a very I didn't check, maybe they have like support for that, but uh it, it at least it it doesn't look like it will appear in a tutorial or something like that. So um for this other approach they they just use something like very much um like what we always see so basically like what they did is like if you have a multi-layer uh, auto encoder what they do is like okay we, we can just say like, do like two layers at a time so what, what let's see the original model is something like that I should, I should write like this like a model like this they're trying to train a uh, auto encoder like this so what they're doing is like I can train uh, one weight one layer at a time so for example like I trying to train this layer here so what I'm going to do is I, I put in this one and then I kind of like repeat that like so instead of like directly to this guy I attach to uh, directly going to recover that X already so and we train this and then when it converge we have weights for this one right so similarly uh, after that uh, after you train that then of course you also get the coefficients here right? you get the second layer outputs here so you can use the second layer outputs to do the same thing so now you can train this layer then then you can train the next layer and so on then you have a pre-train uh, pre-training for each of the layer then afterward again you can do just um, a regular back pop so um, and out of Pretty interesting application of autoencoder is so uh, long as this denoising autoencoder. The idea is like instead of like having the trying to recover the input, we'll start with some input that is a uh, clean input, but then we apply some noise into that. And this noisy input we will plug into the autoencoder model. And then I will try to uh, train the autoencoder such that. It will recover not this layer, not this noisy version, but recover the um, clean version here. And since this is not for dimension reduction, we can afford to have the middle layer to be wider. It doesn't matter. And um, if we do that, like it, you, you have a pretty nice uh, uh, denoising uh, algorithm here. So, for example, this is the original data. You have the noisy data here, and you recover really well here, as you can see. Um, and uh, <coughs> and that's another algorithm that you have a similar favor uh, and uh, this is known as the contractive uh, autoencoder um, the, um, the so the idea is to say a little bit like uh, denoising autoencoder if you think of like what denoising autoencoder does is that you're, you're trying to train the model such that like it would be kind of insensitive to changes of your input right um, you have the original image here so if you make some noise here that's basically you can think of it as a slight perturbation of this orig original image it won't affect your um, out output that much if if affect the output very much then you you won't get a denoise result right? basically you you get something different right so the whole point is like you have the original image you kind of perturb a little bit this one what you get is still like kind of similar to the original one so 
So we want to have this. Basically, we have want to have the model. It's kind of insensitive to this slight perturbation. So what we can do is like we, we can, instead of trying to uh, kind of do it uh, uh, implicitly, we can do it explicitly. We just change the uh, uh, loss function directly. Basically, we have the loss function Lx here, the original loss function. Now what we're going to do, we'll add a slight penalty here uh, to the total variation of, uh, of the gradient with respect to x. So basically, like we want uh, the hx doesn't change too much with respect to x, y. So we can just say for uh, hx, I say this is the middle layer is the representation there. So we just compute the gradient of that guy and compute this forbiddenness norm. Forbiddenness norm is basically the square of uh, all the elements. So it's just, you think of it just a norm. So then, um, so, so if we also add this penalty, then uh, we will have a similar effect of a denoising autoencoder. So that uh, actually, that's advantage and disadvantage. Like because uh, it's more stable, you can actually use second order the optimizer and so on. Um, and uh, uh, MI so it actually could be more stable for denoising autoencoder. Uh, but of course, it's a little bit more complex to implement. Right? It's not like Deloitte autoencoder. You can just add a line and then you can implement that. This you need to actually change the loss function. Um, and uh, about pre-training, as you can see, like for both, uh, uh, both like from Banjo group or sort of or from Hinton group, uh, when they try to tackle this autoencoder, they they use this pre-training, and. Uh, and uh, this is such a remark by Banjo like several years ago, like himself is, uh, is mentioned a problem with p-training is kind of greedy, uh, uh, it's, that's not tuned to the lower layers and so on. And uh, he mentioned there's a new approach he's working on, this is like several years ago, of course. And uh, <coughs> and uh, that's another remark by a uh, good fellow, like, uh, and um, p-training is, and um, he mentioned that nowadays uh, we know that like uh, as long as we we have sufficient data like also and also of uh, with all the other trick like batch normalization like uh, weighting initialization and so on you can actually like uh, train rather well like without this uh, uh, p training so therefore like this p training now is like uh, mostly obsolete but I I don't know it's hard to say like you know this. Uh, research just come back and forth like maybe several years later people suddenly realize that like, you still have some use like somewhere uh, using p training but at the current stage it's uh, more um, um, much less common than like, it used to be um, finally I'd like to talk about the variational autoencoder <coughs> so as I mentioned like, everything I talk about about autoencoder actually like, for the last uh, or a couple lectures I like we, we we were focusing on a generative model right? so we I like to include like autoencoder here because I like to talk about variation of autoencoder this is also a generative model so um okay this is the motivation right we want to create an autoencoder can also like generate generate data so and then uh, have the variational you will see like why I call it variational Basically, you use this uh, variational influence uh, trick there, so therefore called variational uh, autoencoder. <coughs> and um, it uh, it has uh, kind of okay. Uh, let's see the the idea. Of course, uh, if you want to have a generative model, you you need to have some randomness, right? So what we are going to build is something like you you have the decoder side, you have some. Uh, uh, code here, C here, it only specifies the mean of like uh, some statistics and from that mean you will pull out the uh, data here, x hat here. <coughs> um, and to train the model, like we want to maximize this evidence also, this PXT here, and uh, uh, or like log PXT or like minimize this mi minus log PXT. I mean, if you look, think of like those PX, like <coughs> this C typically, typically, this will be we can assume to be uh, just a normal distribution, something like um, with a pi normal distribution, and then like, we have um, 
X given C, this is like the model that of this uh, decoding model, PV the X given C that uh, is specified by the network. So to specify this PX, so therefore it's an integral of the PC and PV the given X theory. Right? So this can be pretty difficult to solve. Like it's, uh, in general, it's not analytically, analytically tractable. Um, so um, inside you see inside what we're going to do. And I, but and also one remark, I, if we specify the encoder, uh, actually, sorry, this is a decoder side. If we specify the decoder, theoretically, like the encoder have to be linked to the decoder, right? And indeed, like if you have the decoder is defined by this uh, p theta x given c, then apparently the encoder should have a distribution like that, right? By base rule, so that's just p c times p theta. Uh, X given C over PX, right? Uh, because like this, when you multiply these together, it's just PXC, right? And then over PX will be PC given X by base rule. Uh, but again, like, how, how should we implement that? Of course, like, it turns out it's like both encoder and decoder, we will be implementing that as a network. So, uh, <coughs> so as I as I mentioned, like, I have encoder as a network here. Uh, so if the encoder lateral, uh, sorry, decoder laterals will spit out like a uh, kind of a filter. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, not filter. Spit out. Uh, this is a like parameter filter. The lateral is parameter filter will spit out the mean of the actual data here, uh, and uh, the uh, <coughs> for on the encoder side, I have a lateral going to kind of compress in the mean, and then like. Uh, from the mean, I'm going to get the C here. So, uh, I, again, like for the whole model, like okay, uh, the whole model is always we trying to, uh, to train that we're trying to, uh, maximize this log p or then like minimize this minus log p probability, uh, for 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 x, uh, for x, uh, in the training data here. <coughs> And uh, and um, <coughs> and as I mentioned, that this one here, because I like, p x here is really that integral, right? And in general, will be intractable. So, if 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 we want to, okay, we try to maximize this guy. Then at least we need to be able to wipe that equation out, right? So, because this will be the actual loss function, if we cannot even write it out, we cannot do bad part, right? We cannot find the gradient for that one. For that one. So, therefore, like, instead of trying to minimize these guys and minus log P, we will try to minimize an alternative, like a, 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 a replacement. So, and this is actually this, where, what variational, why is called variational autoencoder. We are going to use this uh, pretty standard, like, techniques in uh, statistics as long as, long as this variational uh, lower bound. So um, it's not really very complicated. You have like PX is like that, right? I have log PX given my model here. I know X, uh, uh, X given C and also C and PC given X here. Now I have this one here, right? This is just, I, I can impose a, uh, this dummy term here uh, Q five C given X M here like on the numerator and denominator. So look look that here like this is actually uh the conditional property uh of the decoder side, right? It's like trying to given C I'm going to spit out X here and this is like the encoder lateral. This is actually basically modeling the decoder lateral, this modeling the encoder lateral. So if I write okay at this dummy thing here I can rearrange the terms now I have three terms here so I have this guy here, then I have Q five over let's see. I, I can this term group together, I got this one here, and then the rest two terms I group together, I get this one here. Now then I this is log function, I try to this is hold true for hold true for all possible uh, X and Z. So in particular I can consider that this the C for drawing from a distribution Q find C given X here. So if I do that, so what I have is I, I have this here. Right? 
Now the second term here, this expectation C, uh, log Q find C given X. This is just the KL divergence, right? Remember, like the KL divergence of like uh, P M Q is just equal to P X log P X uh, over Q X, sum over X, something like that. So this part here, or like, okay, if I write like this, it's a essentially like expectation um, log p x over q x with x is draw from p something like that. So therefore, like this is just KL divergence. And all, you know the KL divergence is always positive, right? So therefore, the remaining part is is actually a lower bound. So what we are going to do is like we are going to uh, maximize this lower bound instead instead of like maximize this log p. So is that clear? So um, and uh, if you look at this lower bound, so therefore like as I mentioned, like, we are going to maximize this lower bound for theta and phi. And um, again, like, theta phi is basically the parameter for the encoder and decoder lateral. So um, this will be the uh, decoder lateral. This is the encoder lateral. So <coughs> So what what it means is like what we what it means is like we want to for the two terms we want to make this we want to maximize this elbow way right? so this uh, evidence oh by the way why it's called like uh, evidence lower bound also because like typically in statistics you have like if x is like your data and p is your model model probability model probability distribution then p theta x will be long as the evidence sometimes so therefore like this is known as the evidence uh, lower bound and uh, <coughs> so as i said like we here maximizing that will mean minimize this guy and maximize this guy right so minimizing these guys uh will be uh make these two codes together we right? want this decoder to have like statistics like pc here okay, distribution like pc here and then also like at the same time we want this to be big so uh, this log p theta x given c to be big when c is drawn from the uh, yeah this is like the actually this is like quite intuitive as well this is like the encoder uh, distribution right c is like the code basically the code that x is the input again C is like the code right? when you have the model Q fine that your lateral say have a distribution Q fine your C is say drawing from that uh, you you want the probability of your X is big given your C well of course like, it's, it's apparent right uh, then okay the, 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 the same things uh, you'll be okay right? okay one thing one remark here It's that like we have that loss function here. There's an expectation here. Like you have a C here. So uh, eventually, like you see, uh, I I I go through this um, f. You think of like this is a function of uh, function of uh, Z, right? So let's say this is like the final loss or like something like that. That that one will depend on Z, right? Z will keep it depend on phi or depend on x. No, but C itself is a random variable, right? So when you do bad pop, like, you don't know how to do a password derivative of a random variable with fast back to some parameters. So, but luckily, like, this is like a pretty standard trick now. This is some like the reparameterization trick. That is like, instead of like, you have a C here that is like uh, random, you just say, okay, the randomness is like out of something else. Now, this is a like, uh, kind of, um, it's deterministic. But I, I have this randomness is pulling out from outside. So therefore like this function is deterministic too, so I can take password duty for this guy with respect to these parameters here. So therefore I can back pull back. So this is just a kind of summary slide, so you, you uh, maybe I just quickly uh, go for that. So you have this input data here, uh, then um, um, yeah actually yeah, this doesn't say much, honestly. But <coughs> after we train the model here, so again, like this part is the encoder, this part is the decoder. Then, of course, I, after we train the model here, this part is like the generator in GANs, right? So we have a code here. Actually, we can generate data. It's very, very fun, right? Again, 
So, um, and uh, this is like you, you can use that to generate data. And this is like some data generated like for MNIST data set. So you see like, uh, it's, it's quite interesting. And, and it's pretty cool because like the, for each of the dimension, this is like basically two assets here. You can see like how you vary the assets here. They have like different kind of how this change of this generated data. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, like this is like two to Z axis here. Um, and uh, this is another example, like uh, this is phases. Like, if you move in like different directions here, you can have like one axis is actually changing the head pose and the other axis is changing the how they smile. Yeah, this is a like, um, pretty cool. And uh, this is more data set like for Cypher 10 like, and also like for this, uh, uh, label phases in the wild. So of course, I like, comparing with GANs is not as uh, the quality doesn't look like as uh, impressive, but um, but there's some pros and cons. Like, uh, uh, something like the variational influ influence is a little bit more. I think it's like, a little bit easier to train, especially it's like it's um, again like end to end. So it's like uh, very much. Uh, uh, standard procedure or uh, in terms of training and uh, it's more stable the the model actually um and uh, <coughs> and um of course uh, if you compare with like uh, some other models for example like pixel r and then pixel cnn uh, it's, it's still less direct because like, we are actually maximizing a lower bound instead of the exact cost function. Um, and I already mentioned that like, comparatively the quality is a little bit worse than GANs. Um, but of course, like, as good fellow mentioned like, in one of his uh, kind of, like, interview, uh, it's not quite clear like, uh, whether really GANs is doing better or like it's simply because like, th those researchers um, who are interested in like data generation, like expect especially image generation. Uh, those using um, those are actually they themselves are expert like in computer graphics and so on. Like turns out are especially interested in GANs. Maybe like the GAN structure is pretty. I mean, in terms of math, that's not my math in GANs, right? I, and the main idea is very, very, uh, very easy to understand. You train your generator. And, Kind of discriminator at the same time, and that's it, right? So if you look at this variation auto in, uh, encoder, there's some math behind that. Maybe for those fellow, they find uh, GANs are more um, more easy to digest, or I don't know. So like it turns out, like more people are interested in GANs. So he said that like, he's not quite sure. Actually, good fellow said that he he was not quite sure whether it's really the the reason is like from GANs, like better result. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, I, I just I was trying to read like some of this thing. Like uh, other polls, yeah, end to end. I mentioned that um, allow influence like kill fine that can be used for future web. Yeah, yes, yes. This this of course is is a. Uh, um, this is actually like uh, you can train a feature for that. So you, you can, uh, as you can see earlier, like the decoder part is generated, right? the encoder part you can think of is actually a uh, feature extractor is like just like, uh, like uh, unsupervised learning. So, um, and uh, some follow up research, I, um, one, one thing like, I guess I, uh, I, I, I think like I, at least I, I, I know like Banjo Group has been very interested in that like for a while, like, I listened to a couple of the interview. Like he, he always mentioned that is like how he can disentangle like mm. features. Basically, like you see, like uh, for example, like in this um, features here, like for the MS data set, you have like um, the two. Basically, the two coefficients here are kind of entangled with each other. Right? I have this. This part is one. So something like not like I I have one asset is just or like one coefficient is just going to generate one or like one asset is just going to generate two, 
or more like two. It's like uh, like a combination here. So this one is more like this rectangle. This one axis is just sh shifting the hand pose, head pose, and the other axis is like getting the degree of smiling. Um, and uh, he, he's kind of interested how you can do that. Like if you can disentangle those features, it would be very very attractive. But uh, I guess it's I I think actually. Uh, keep track of this this line of research, so um, so I cannot uh, recommend, I recommend comment more. But uh, apparently, this is something very interesting to study as well. So uh, this is a quick conclusion of like this several lectures like on generative models. We uh, of course we talk about like finally we talk about variation well, auto encoder. We spend quite some time again, uh, and also like um, I guess very quick roughly like go through this pixel CNN and pixel RNN and also. Um, we mentioned Boltzmann machine as well. Like you can consider that as a generative model. So um, I, I guess I, I'm just on time. I will just stop here.